Do you have an open mind? Can you suspend judgment for a moment? Most people can't. But what if your job depends on it? What if the freedom to hug people depends on it? What if your life depends on it? Here's a new theory. First, consider that we live in a world where everything is toxic. The soil, the water, the air, our food, even our medicines are toxic. Even stress can be toxic. Now imagine that all these toxins are poisonous to us on a cellular level. Imagine that our cells have a defense and respond to this situation. Poisoned genetic material, either RNA or DNA, is packaged up and sent out of the cell in tiny balls of protein. Let's call these balls of genetic material exosomes. Let's imagine that exosomes can act as messages to alert other cells of a particular poison and so all throughout the body, more and more cells package up the poisoned material and release it. Also, at certain times of the year due to temperature cycles, humans tend to purge a high number of these poisoned genetic materials out of the body resulting in symptoms of illness. These exosomes neither cause illness nor are they infectious, though they do appear to spread throughout the body. Now that's exosome theory. Let's move on to the established theory of viruses. Viruses are generally regarded as not alive. They have no cellular structure and do not reproduce on their own. Though we do have trillions of them inside our bodies. They are tiny bits of genetic material, either RNA or DNA, packaged in tiny protein balls that appear to exit and enter cells. Sound familiar? We believe that some of these entities are infectious and pathogenic, transmitting amongst humans and reproducing inside our bodies, causing illness and death. So let's look at the situation for this coronavirus and compare what is happening to these two theories. Let's first consider the origin story of the coronavirus. A group of people had a respiratory illness unresolved by antibiotics, so medical officials began looking, of course, for a virus. What they eventually found under the electron microscope were small protein balls being excreted by the cell. Okay, first comparison. This would make sense in both exosome theory and virus theory. Then they searched for and found an RNA fragment that they had not seen before in some of these patients. This would make sense in both exosome theory and virus theory. Now they did not prove that they could infect somebody or an animal with a purified form of this so-called virus. They simply assumed that this RNA fragment was the cause of the illness they saw in some patients and they assumed it was contagious. So do you know how the tests work? It's not a binary test, like a pregnancy test. It's called a PCR test and it involves amplifying genetic material by doubling it in dozens of cycles until you have billions or trillions of the original molecules and then using those results to determine if you have enough of the identified RNA fragment to be considered positive. Here's the thing, at a certain point of amplification, every single person would test positive. They use an arbitrary cutoff point where they stop doubling the material. That cutoff point is different amongst different tests for COVID-19. In fact, there were 10 different cutoff points amongst the 33 tests approved by the FDA. Seems a little strange, right? You might find it interesting that the Nobel Prize winning inventor of the test did not believe it should be used to diagnose infectious illness. And perhaps you've heard about some of the problems with the test, such as the high rate of false positives. But in any case, let's say that after 37 times of doubling a specific genetic material they found in your body, they determine that you have enough of the RNA they are looking for to be considered positive. This could make sense in both exosome theory and virus theory. But clearly there are clusters of people getting ill. Look at New York City. It must be a virus. However, if you are being poisoned by something in your environment, 
it's likely people near you are too. And if we commonly purge these poisons during specific times of the year, many people may have symptoms of illness all at once. This fits either theory. Now, here's where things get interesting. Let's go to the Diamond Princess cruise ship situation. Did you know that people who were bunked together for days had conflicting positive and negative tests? How could one person have this highly infectious illness but not transmit it to somebody bunking with them for days? This would make sense in exosome theory, where the balls of RNA are not contagious, but it would not make sense for virus theory, where the balls of RNA are supposed to be highly infectious. Let's take a look at the first case of transmission in Illinois. A woman traveled to Wuhan, came back, and both she and her chronically ill husband ended up testing positive. Medical authorities then tracked over 300 people who had had close contact with them to see who acquired the virus. And guess what? Zero positives. This again would make sense in exosome theory, since exosomes are not contagious. But it would not make sense for virus theory, where this is supposed to be an infectious virus. In fact, do you know that there are many documented cases all around the world of patients testing positive for this RNA fragment with no relevant travel history and no known possible contact with somebody who was infected? These were people in the middle of nowhere, early on in this whole crisis, who suddenly were testing positive. This would make sense, again, in exosome theory, where the RNA is being produced as an immune response within our cells. But it would not make sense for virus theory, where you are supposed to have had contact with somebody with the virus. What about the high levels of people testing positive who don't get sick? In fact, 80% of people testing positive are either asymptomatic or have slight cold symptoms. Why? And this would make sense in exosome theory, since the RNA fragments are not the cause of the illness. But it would not make sense for virus theory, where this virus is supposed to cause the illness. Things get even stranger. Did you know that some people go from testing positive, to testing negative, to testing positive again in a matter of days? And that would make sense for exosome theory, where perhaps the cells are simply releasing more or less of these exosomes depending on certain conditions. But it doesn't make sense in virus theory, where you are supposedly infected until you have rid yourself of the virus. So which of these theories seems more likely to you? What if you heard that there are virologists who believe that viruses are actually exosomes? What if I told you that doctors and other scientific experts also believe this? Ultimately, regardless of which theory you believe in at this point, the established infectious virus theory or the emerging theory of exosomes, how confident are you in the PCR test? Are you really interested in having your life hinge on the results you get from this potentially meaningless test? Do you want your loved ones tested? Do you want to be tested? العقل والجنون احتوت مجموعة الدكتور روزنهان على ثمانية أشخاص لا يعانون من أي مرض عقلي وهم أحد طلبته وثلاثة علماء نفس وطبيب أطفال وطبيب نفسي وصباغ وربة منزل اتفق روزنهان أن يذهب هو إلى مستشفى في بنسلفانيا ويذهب بقية أفراد المجموعة إلى مستشفيات في ولايات أخرى وفي فترات مختلفة طلب روزنهان من أفراد مجموعته أن يدعوا عرضا واحدا فقط وهو أنهم يسمعون أصواتا تخاطبهم وتردد ثلاث كلمات وهي فراغ فجوة وارتطام والسبب في اختيار هذا الإدعاء لأنه لا يمثل أي عرض لأي مرض عقلي في علم النفس بعد أن تمت مقابلة الجميع شخص الأطباء سبعة منهم بمرض انفصام الشخصية والثامن بمرض اضطراب ثنائي القطب وأدخلوا الجميع إلى المستشفيات وبمجرد دخولهم للمستشفيات بدأوا يتصرفون بشكل طبيعي دون التظاهر بوجود الأصوات الغريبة ومع ذلك لم يلاحظ أي من الأطباء أنهم طبيعيين بل على العكس بدأوا بإعطائهم أدوية أمراض نفسية استمرت إقامة أفراد المجموعة بالمستشفيات من 7 إلى 52 يوم 
بعد أن خرج الجميع أعلن الدكتور روزنهان عن نتائج تجربته التي استنتج من خلالها أن الأطباء النفسيين ليس لديهم طريقة سليمة لتشخيص الأمراض العقلية مما سبب الصدمة بالمجتمع الأمريكي وأغضب العديد من أطباء النفس الذين اتهموه بخداعهم أحد المستشفيات تحدى روزنهان أن يكرر تجربة معهم فوافق روزنهان على التحدي وأخبر الأطباء في هذا المستشفى أنه سيرسل لهم مرضى مزيفين خلال الثلاثة أشهر القادمة وبالفعل بعد انتهاء المدة المتفق عليها اكتشف الأطباء أكثر من عشرين مريض مزيف المضحك في الموضوع أن روزنهان لم يرسل أي أحد هذه المرة نشر روزنهان تجربته الشهيرة في مجلة ساينس المرموقة في عام 1973 في ورقة علمية بعنوان أن تكون عاقلا في أماكن مجنونة ووصفها المؤرخ وعالم الاجتماع أندرو سكل بأنها أحد أكثر المقالات العلمية تأثيرا في علم الاجتماع بالرغم من الانتقادات التي وجهت إليها